who's responsible for this? So she said, it's my boss, the guy I work for. Him. So the mother says, I'll fix him. She calls the number, she says, my daughter just told me she's pregnant and you're the father. What are you going to do about it? So he says, well, if it's a boy, I'll give him half the business. If it's a girl, I'll give her $200,000. So the mother thinks about this and she says, if it's a miscarriage, we'll give her another chance. We a of humor. Can you laugh at anything? Yeah, yeah. We were ready to laugh before he told the joke, so it doesn't mean that. Okay. Okay, children. Oh, Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give us the word. There's one thing I can tell you for sure. That all is well. And everything is unfolding as it should. I can tell you truly, nothing is wrong anywhere. Everything is happening just the way it's supposed to. If you think you've got a problem, that's the mistake, thinking you've got a problem. If only you stop thinking. As soon as you stop thinking, everything will go right. <laughs> Isn't it going right while you're thinking? Yeah, but you don't know it. Yeah, you don't see it. It's just a little see, some of us don't think it is, because some of us think, I've got a problem or I'm involved in something I can't handle, or something is bigger than I am, or something hurts me, or I feel angry, or I feel fear, or I feel something is wrong. But I can assure you, there is nothing wrong. <coughs> nothing has ever been wrong, nothing is wrong now, and nothing will ever be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> all you've got to do, all you've got to do is watch yourself. As soon as your mind starts thinking past your nose, grab it, not your nose, but grab your foot. <laughs> you can grab your nose too if you like. But grab your thoughts with your mind and put a stop to them any way you can. Either by observing your thoughts by practicing self-inquiry and asking to whom do they come. Whatever you have to do, do not allow yourself to think. If your mind does not think, you will be exceedingly <coughs> happy. You will have unalloyed happiness, I can assure you. Total happiness if you stop yourself from thinking. I received many phone calls. One of the calls <laughs> that is most common is, when will I experience self-realization? <laughs> when will I experience self-realization? And this is determined by the consciousness of the person. And I have a different answer for everybody. Because I take you where you're at. This is why it may sound contradictory sometimes. If you ask me a personal question, I try to answer you from where you're coming from. Again, some people tell me, Robert, why don't you just speak the highest truth all the time? And some people tell me, Robert, speak so I can understand what you're talking about. <laughs> so that's the dilemma. So I do whatever I have to do. I plan nothing. Everything is extemporaneous. extemporaneous. I have no rehearsals. <laughs> I don't write anything down. I just say what comes out of me. So, when we have a phone call, when am I going to 
<clears throat> become self-realized. Somebody tells me I've been practicing all week now, <laughs> and nothing is happening. <laughs> Some man called me yesterday, told me he's been practicing for two weeks. He took a seminar and paid seven hundred dollars, <laughs> and he's still not to self-realize. <laughs> I get calls like this all the time. So it depends what you say. This determines the answer I give you. But there's a standard answer. Think of the question. When will I, I, I become self-realized, self-realized, self-realized? <laughs> I usually say this. Before I answer your question, I ask you a question. Please tell me, what do you mean by I? And what do you mean by self-realization? I usually keep silent. So I continue and I say, who do you think the I is who wants to become self-realized? You're speaking about the personal I. And the personal I can never be self-realized. The personal I is finite. The finite can never know the infinite. That's why the personal I can never become self-realized. And as long as you think you are the personal I who needs to be self-realized, there never will be a time when you become self-realized. And then the word, the word self-realized, what does that mean? It simply means your natural state. It is not something you become. It is something you are. You wish to experience your natural state. What you want to do, therefore, is to awaken to your natural state, which you are now. But you've covered it up with the personal I. As long as you keep talking about I am this and I am that, and I need to be self-realized or I need to awaken or I need to do anything, it will never happen. And this is also true of your problems. When you think, I have to solve a problem, I have to take responsibility, you are referring to your personal I. And you will come up with relative ideas that will pull you further into problems. They will never be solved that way. Look back at your experience and you'll see what I'm saying is true. When you try to use your personal I to solve a problem, you may appear to solve it for a while, but another one will pop up now and again, and you go through your life trying to solve problem after problem after problem. You have to understand and realize and see that intelligently. You have to look at that intelligently and realize every time you speak about yourself or any situation in the world, you are referring to your personal I. Now, if you can bypass the personal I, then you wouldn't have the question. For if you realize you're not the personal I, then who is left to become self-realized? No one. <clears throat> when I has gotten out of the way, you become omnipresent. You become I am. Not I am this or I am that. Just I am. Now your I am is the I am of the universe. Consciousness, absolute awareness, I am, is your real nature. You have to awaken to that. not talk about it, not try to convince somebody else, but to simply awaken yourself to the fact that you are I am. And you've always been I am. 
if you can just read in that way, you wouldn't have anything to say after that. Just say to yourself right now, I am. As soon as you say I am, all of your problems, so-called, are resolved. Your life is resolved. Everything is resolved, and you're happy. And just by saying I am. feel beautiful. There is nothing that comes after I am. I am is it. There's nothing else. difficulty with this. Some people say I feel great as long as I'm at that time. But as soon as I get home, the world grabs a hold of me and I get involved in problems. I get involved in more of these things. Again, you're talking about your personal eye. That's what you're going to look at and tell the point. When you tell me I get involved in the world, who's the I? You'll never say I am gets involved in the world because as soon as you say I am, you feel good, don't you? But when you say I get involved in the world, you're thinking of your body, your mind, and your affairs. When you say I am, it all goes away and you become free. When you come to satsang, something happens. You're not creating anything new because there's nothing to create. An awakening process takes place. Just like when you're dreaming. And the dream is so interesting and nice. And you awaken. And you find yourself in this world. So it is when you begin to awaken in this world. You awaken to the fourth state of consciousness. And you appear to be in this world to others. But you're no longer of this world. The body may appear to be real to others. But you realize and you understand that you have no body. I can assure you. I can swear to you. I can promise you that I have no body. And yet you look at me and you say, I see the body. I see you as a body. So I ask you, who sees? Who sees the body? I do. Who am I? Who am I that sees the body? Then there's silence. <clears throat> it's difficult for some of us to understand this, that I have no body. Now what appears to happen is when you're in my company at Satsang, your body consciousness begins to dissolve. 
simply because I understand that I am not the body. When I use the word in my company, or me or I, try to remember always that I'm not referring to Robert. Robert is a horse's ass. <laughs> so, so when I say that you're in my company, I'm not referring to me because I am nothing as Robert. But whenever I use the term I or me or my, I always refer to consciousness, to omnipresence. So what I mean by this, that you're in my company, you're in the company of consciousness. <coughs> There's no differentiation between my consciousness and your consciousness. I see you as consciousness. All I see is consciousness. And again, it's a little difficult to understand. How do I see consciousness? Some people ask me, don't you see the body? Yes, I see the body, but I see it as consciousness. <laughs> and I guess the only way to explain this is if you take a gigantic screen and on the screen there are pictures shown of bodies, of places, of mountains, of hills. The screen is aware of itself as the screen and knows that the objects are superimposed on itself. So it is constantly aware of it being the screen, yet it knows that there are pictures and objects superimposed on the screen. So it is, I realize myself as consciousness, but I also know that the whole world, the whole universe, is also consciousness, or the self. Everything is the self, and I am that. That's what it means. Therefore, from now on, whenever you hear me declare my confession that I am absolute consciousness and I am pure reality, I am such a Dananda, I am ultimate oneness, I am that I am, nirvana emptiness. And this is what I'm referring to. All this is the self and I am that. And the self is like a gigantic screen where there are images superimposed on the screen. But I am aware of the consciousness and the images. I realize the images are false, but I see them. But my feelings, my thoughts, if there are any thoughts, my awareness is always unconsciousness. Now, what does this mean? It means I can be watching a movie. I can be watching TV. I can go to the opera. I can be involved in all kinds of things. But I am not involved in anything. I am free of it. Yet to others, it appears as if I'm involved. This is why I'm no fun to be around. <laughs> People can't understand I can stay home by myself. They want to take me someplace or be with me or feel sorry for me. They say, Rob, it's always by himself. <laughs> he should get out more often. Where would I go? <laughs> it really makes no difference where I am. Every once in a while, Danny used to come and pick me up and take me to a movie. And I would make out I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> and after the movie, she likes to discuss it. <laughs> and I don't know what happened. I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea what's going on. People tell me about their videos and about 
this person about that and about actors and actresses and about my rack and everything else. <laughs> but what have I got to do with that? I realize it's probably going on somewhere, but it's very dim. It's like a dream. I am totally aware of consciousness. Everything else is like a little dream, far away from place. So I can be any place. As an example, I was picked up by three people tonight. So <laughs> three people arrived at the house to take me to such land. And while they were there, they saw people working on my carpet. <laughs> my husband wanted you to leak. <laughs> and the cop was fun. But all day I was watching the goings on sitting on the chair and I was totally unhappy. The happiness is not leave. People can't be living or dying or working, whatever they're doing. How can I be unhappy? Nobody dies. Nothing is wrong. All is well. So how can I possibly be unhappy? It's impossible. So, when we're at satsang, something happens to you to cause you to begin to feel this one also. Now people have asked me, why should I want to be this way? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you do nothing. You're good for nothing. <laughs> you're no fun at the party. <laughs> and you're no fun to be around because there's nothing for me to do. So why should you want to be this way? The main reason is this. Don't you want to be God? <coughs> Don't you want to be totally happy and blissful and be universal, so to speak? Where you just feel and realize I am as the universe. I am as everything that exists. I am that. And I am at peace. I am totally happy, total joy. Everybody's running around with their problems, trying to resolve them and solve them. And I just look, I just watch. And I wonder, how can you believe you've got a problem? Why do you think someone's trying to hurt you? Why do you think someone's trying to take advantage of you? Why are you hurtable? And you don't know why. The answer is simple. Because you are identifying with the personal I. That's the only reason. Remember, you cannot solve any problem by solving the problem itself. You've tried it and it doesn't work. As I said before, when one problem is solved, another one pops up somewhere else. It never ends. But when you annihilate the eye, when the mind becomes quiescent, and rest in the heart. Your natural state, which is called the fourth state, after waking, dreaming, and sleeping, ensues by itself. It comes by itself. Just like the sun that has been covered over by clouds. Only a fool would say the sun doesn't exist because they can't see it. 
the clouds dissipate and the sun shines once again in all its glory and splendor. So it is with us. We're covered with clouds of ignorance that make us believe I'm heritable. I've been raped. Someone is trying to do something to me. I don't mean rape literally, I mean in your mind. Someone is taking advantage of me, someone is trying to do this and do that to me. Those are all lies. You're doing it to yourself because you're thinking past your nose. You're allowing your thoughts to run ramparts with you. Your thoughts are taking you over continuously and leading you astray. You're not putting a stop to this. You're allowing it to happen. Is it any wonder that you feel anger, frustration, out of sorts? Because you will not put a stop to these thoughts when they begin. This is also true with thoughts of dying or sickness or whatever. There's no such thing. Nothing exists but I am. And you should practice that form of meditation. When you inhale, you say I. You exhale, you say am. If you have to meditate, meditate on that with your breathing. The day will come when you awaken and you will not have to do anything. But in the meanwhile, you do the best you can. But as you're doing the best you can, realize that consciousness is what you are, and consciousness loves you, for you are its own. It will never leave you nor forsake you. If you cannot do anything else, Surrender to consciousness. What I mean about surrender is surrender your ego, your problems, your emotions, your fears, your frustrations, your hurts, your anger. Give it all up. Say, take it, consciousness. If that's too abstract for you, Give it all to me. I'll take it and chew it up for you and spit it out. So when you wake up in the morning and you feel out of sorts, you feel angry or frustrated, say, okay, Robert, take this from me. I'm giving it to you. And I'm happy to take it off your shoulders so you can carry a lighter load. If that's what you have to do, do that. But by all means, do not get carried away with your emotions. Stop in the middle and watch. Watch your emotions ruling you. Watch your fears controlling you. Watch your anger popping up. Do not try to stop it. Just watch. Observe. Look intelligently. And realize who is it, who it is that's getting angry or frustrated. It's not you. That's not even your ego because there is no ego. It's not your body because there is no body. It's not your mind because there's no mind. 
Therefore, what is making you angry? Nothing. It's like the story I told of the Zen monk who was in his quarters and he'd get angry every now and again. He'd start arguments with his fellow monks, always looking for something wrong, always complaining, whining, always telling people his troubles, and he'd get real angry. So his fellow monk said, why don't you go see the Roshi, the head of the monks, and tell him to help you? So he said, okay. And the Roshi was about two miles down the road. So he went down there and explained his position to the Roshi. So the Roshi said, okay, here's what I'll do. Take my staff and hold on to it. Now, whenever you get angry, my staff will remind you to come to me, and I will get rid of your anger for you. So he went back to his quarters, and that night he really got angry at some other monks. So he looked at the staff and remembered the Roshi, so he started to run through the Roshi. And he finally got there, he was jogging all the way. So the Roshi said, what's wrong? And he said, I got angry. The Roshi said, show me your anger. Well, in the jogging, the anger went away. He had nothing to show him. And he said, I'm not angry right now. The Roshi said, go back to your quarters, and when you get angry again, come and tell me about it. The next day, he got angry again. He ran to the Roshi, and the same thing happened. And the running to the Roshi, his anger disappeared. And the Roshi said, where's your anger? And he said, it's gone now. And this went down about 25 times. Finally, the last time, the Roshi said, okay, I'll tell you what you do now. When you get back to your quarters, take my staff I gave you, and when you get angry, beat the living hell out of your anger with my staff. And this was so funny to the monk that he became realized and became enlightened. Because he realized he would take the staff and beat himself. And his real self could never get angry. But it was his body that tried to get angry. And just that running back and forth 25 times and the answer the Roshi gave him made him open his eyes and become enlightened. So the thought is with us. Do not look at your problem as a problem. Look at it as a no thing. It doesn't exist. Again, if your ego does not exist, if your body does not exist, if your mind does not exist, how can you be angry? Where would it come from? Who gave it birth? And this is true of every other problem you believe you've got. Just by watching it, like I just pointed out, it will disappear and you will awaken to your true self. Now we'll go into questions. <laughs> Feel free to ask anything you like. Do not be embarrassed. Ask a question about what we've discussed, or about what's going on in your life. We're all one big happy family. So I'm not feel embarrassed to ask anything. Who's first? <laughs> I'll talk to 
talk about something else. I was talking about all the phone calls I get in the beginning. People are still asking me, what do you think about this Swami? What do you think about this person? What's your opinion about this person and that person? Why shouldn't I go see other teachers as well? And I really do not know what to say. And you have to do what your heart tells you to do. But I can tell you, the more people you see, the more confused you'll become. Now, I don't care if you never come back here again, because I'm not looking for anything. But if you do find a teacher that you seem to have an affinity with, you should stick around that teacher for a while. Because if you run from teacher to teacher, from meeting to meeting, you're going to become totally confused. Every teacher has their place. And you will be attracted to the person you have to be with for the time being. It all depends where your consciousness is. <clears throat> Again, I will discuss something that a couple of people asked me to discuss. I've done this before, but it's good to bring it up again and again every once in a while. There are three types of people who go on the spiritual path. One type is called a seeker, another is called a disciple, and the third is called a devotee. The seekers are the worst ones <laughs> because they never stop seeking. While they're in class, they're thinking about what they're going to see tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> they never stop. They run around from pole to post. They go to India to seek a teacher. They go to Hawaii to see another teacher. They go to St. Louis when they're about another teacher. And they're seekers. Now this is good to an extent because they're better off than the people who do nothing and think they're human. But you can be a seeker for a thousand lifetimes and it will never end. If you are a seeker that, that is really sincere and in your heart you truly wish to awaken, the time will come when you stop being a seeker and you become a disciple. Now a disciple finds a teacher and tries to learn all they can from that teacher. But yet they're still not sure. They still have doubts. They're still interested in me, me, me. What am I getting out of this? What's in it for me? And once in a while I'll go to other teachers also. But they're still staying around one particular teacher and they become a disciple of that teacher but they're not that close for if they still hear about another teacher coming to town they go see that teacher also and of course there's confusion in their consciousness but they're getting closer if a disciple is really sincere in their heart and they really have love and compassion and goodness 
and kind feelings towards all. They will eventually become a devotee. Now a devotee becomes the consciousness of the teacher. A devotee forgets all about him or herself. They can be in class. Everyone is going wild, throwing spitballs at each other. But a devotee sees nothing but a teacher. The devotee is oblivious to everything that's going on in the class. but only has love and good feelings to all. And is interested in the teacher's welfare and ultimately becomes enlightened. So it is devotees who awaken faster than anybody else. Think for yourself. In what category are you? To be quite truthful with you, I'd rather have five devotees around me than 10,000 people who are seekers. But now we'll go back to questions. Feel free to make comments. If you think I'm a dirty dog, just say so. <laughs> Robert, it sound, sounded like you were describing uh, devotees as uh, the bhaktas. Where does that leave the yani? Bhaktas and devotees and yanis are the same. Our real yani is a devotee of the self. And the self is everywhere. So they're really a bhakta. And they're a yani, they're both the same. There's no differentiation, really. So you're saying, actually, the, the yani has a lot of love? Yes, they're supposed to, or they wouldn't be a yani. Well, I mean, inspiring. They should be full of love and kindness and joy and peace towards everything. So really, it's not useful making that distinction. No, you make a distinction. Who makes the distinction? The Ayani. The person who is not a Bhakta and is not a Yani makes a distinction. But if a devotee even knows about these things, Then they're aspiring for yana, they're aspiring for bhakti, and they ultimately reach the goal because they learn to keep quiet, not to talk too much, not to think too much, not to judge at all, but just to be quiet and watch. And they've got their eyes fixed on the teacher like a lion has its eyes fixed on the rabbit. It sees nothing but the rabbit. Everything may be going on all around the lion, but it only sees the rabbit until it catches its prey. So a real devotee identifies totally with the teacher and finally becomes like the teacher. Robert, can all these phases be passed through in one lifetime? Yes, definitely. They can all be passed through instantaneously, like right now. 
this moon. You just have to wake up. There's no time. Time is an illusion. Hmm. Um, there are distinctions often made between a, a gradual path and instantaneous enlightenment. Find out throughout you know, spiritual teachers or spiritual literature. And a lot of this stuff about passing through these stages, I don't know, you know, I can only talk for myself. It just doesn't, I can't relate to it. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know, I don't feel bad about it or good or anything, but it just, it doesn't make any sense to me. What can't you relate to? Well, just the idea that you pass through one stage to the next stage to the next stage. So this is for the ayani. Right. This is for the person who's striving. And uh, of course, in truth, there's nothing to pass through. But it appears that people need to understand these things so they can search in themselves and be able to see where they're coming from. And this will help them tremendously. Perhaps you don't need it, but I understand. Well, I think about the time at uh, Ramana Ashram when Janapati Muni said something to Ramana about, uh, you know, Ramana just says to these people, you're the self, wake up or something. And he says, but don't they have to go through all these stages? And Ramana says, well, maybe, but I don't know anything else. And that's right. You know, and I, I remember there were like, people said there were two schools of thought at the ashram. You know, the people who believed there were the mm-hmm. gradual changes you had to go through. Mm-hmm. And then there were the people who believed in instantaneous enlightenment. not really the same as what you were talking about, your state, which is really, I wouldn't call it happiness in a sense, because it seems like so far above the happiness that's, uh, you know, opposite sadness. Mm. You know, it's like You're right. Sadness could even come into that state that you are in, and it would just be some other thing sort of passing through in a sense, wouldn't it? You're right. No identification. As an example, I can cry at the funeral. But I realize who's crying. I can have all kinds of sadness for a long time. But I'm never really sad. You know, he was right when you said that. It appears to be like that. It's like the state of non-abiding mind. That's really the closest thing to it, isn't it? That's You're right. Oh. That's true. That's true. I'm looking for words to describe this. But there's always total happiness. But it's not human happiness. There are no things involved. For most people to be happy, there has to be a person, place, or thing involved in their happiness. But in true happiness, <coughs> There are no things involved to make you happy. It's a natural state. And you abide in that state forever. From the standpoint of uh, practice, I notice that no matter what state comes up, am I willing to ask myself, can I let this go? You know what I mean? Do I do I feel stuck in it, or is it that important to me that I that I stay in this sort of emotional state? And the real answer to that is that there's nothing you can do anyway, mm. because it comes and it goes, and it's noticed to be that. And yet, act as if there's something you can do, even though there's nothing you can do. Mm. Act as if there's something that you can do. As an example. If you're passing a starving man on the road, don't say there's nothing you can do and leave him alone. Give him a piece of bread. Mm -hmm. Act as if there's something you can do. But in that, say with regard to, you know, the mind arising and the emotions arising and perceptions arising, just that, there's nothing you can do. Except watch. Yeah. Just observe and watch. And even that, if you turn it into something you think you're doing, it's not really what you're talking about. Yes. 
know, like in the Vipassana retreats, for example, you try to cultivate a mind that watches, but that couldn't be it. No, it's not about that. But you're doing that in the beginning as a procedure, as a process, because that's where you're at at the time that it's being done. So you can't say that's wrong or right. It's just where you're at now. Another thing to consider is this. If I were here as a visitor, and having one class with you and never see me again, I would expound the highest truth and take off. And you would say how great that is. But when I see you twice a week or more, I begin to know you quite well. And everything I say is to help you grow. Because that's what needs to be said to you at the time. Since I'm going to be with you. The people who are with their mind as devotees. He didn't expound absolute truth to them all the time. He would talk to them like a normal person. He would inquire about their welfare, about their health, about their problems, and give them practical advice. He wouldn't say nothing matters. <laughs> because nothing exists. <laughs> They know that already, but they can't help it. They've got the problems. So we talk to them in a practical manner. Last night, Robert, um, with my partner, who's uh, pregnant. Your partner's pregnant? Um, who's this one? Who's responsible? <laughs> I don't know. Two hundred thousand. Anyway, um, you know, our child's coming in July. At least that's what we think. And <clears throat> from last night, living with a pregnant woman is a, is a great um, practice of not taking anything personal. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Her mood changes within five minutes, and. But last night, though, she got really into anxiety about taking care of the ch child as insurance and having, you know, where's the money going to come from? What can the devotee tree does where they can practically bring in lots mm -hmm. of money and all this. And I remember getting caught up in the, in the emotions, but while I'm doing that, I'm asking, who's getting caught up in the emotions? But yet, this body and the emotions are going, getting caught up. And, I don't know, it's, it seems there's a part that just kind of watches it, and there's a part that kind of, I don't know if it's a way of just retreating or not wanting to look at what she's dragging me into. I'm not so. Well, since you're living with her, help her to the best of your ability, right. but be impersonal. Do not become attached to him. Practice non-attachment. Yet help her all you can. Be kind, gentle. And do the best you can. I feel like the most loving thing to do at the time would, would be to get insurance to help her appear. Yeah. Well, if that's what you feel like doing. But just by being kind to her will help. Being gentle and peaceful. And realize what you're going through. That alone will take care of her. But as far as you're concerned, and realize where all this is coming from. She's involved in the personal eye. <clears throat> and she's worried about her body and her affairs. Maybe you can help her in that way. Telling her not to worry because God loves her. And will take care of her and will watch her. And everything will turn out all right. That kind of advice would be helpful. Well, the time doesn't really take that too long. I appreciate it. Well, just keep silent and say it to yourself. But if you can become calm and peaceful, something within you will tell you what to do. You will 
these lines by the powers that be. The more calm you can make yourself, the more peaceful you can make yourself, the more you can control your mind, the greater the answer will be. And you will know what to do. And you'll do it for the good of all concerned. <coughs> I have something to say. I don't know whether it's a question, though. Okay. I don't know whether it's a statement either. But it seems to me that, it seems to me sometimes that this is all very intellectual in spite of what you say. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of talking about uh, all of the process, uh, the asking of, about the eye and all that kind of thing. And I, you know, I, of course, I've done a lot of reading like everybody else. And although I'm very uh, critical of Virgia, I was very interested uh, always in the idea of the dancing mm. and of the work that was done, I mean the physical work. Mm. And as we know, there's dancing in, in other systems. And sometimes I feel that it's almost more important to give attention to the body uh, as it moves, as it moves through life and as it moves through the day um, in certain ways. And that this is this kind of uh, unconscious knowledge that we're looking for, unconscious, uh, the approach to what you're looking for, that the body itself undergoes um, uh, experiences that enlighten us, and that this is uh, in a different realm than our intellectual speculations. I know, for example, that when, when I dance, there's a place in Santa Monica called Dance Home where you, sometimes at night you have 50 people dancing alone by themselves in a kind of a dark room. Uh, with colored lights. Well, for me, this is this is a spiritual experience uh, because there seems to be almost an integration of, of body, mind, spirit. Of course, the average person cannot sit home alone and think because they go crazy. So when you dance and when you become active, it keeps you from going crazy from thinking. So what you're saying is true as far as that's concerned. But that's on the relative plane. And you have to remember what body are you talking about? The body is transcendent. And you're not the same body you were 25 years ago. And you're not the same body you were when you were five years old. You're a completely different body. So what body are you referring to? And pretty soon your body will become old and crippled and whatever. So you'll be referring to that body that cannot dance any longer, that has no energy, that has no power, that has to sit in bed all day when you get to be 90 years old and so forth. See, so what body are you referring to? Why keep your mind on your body when you can keep your mind on yourself that never changes and that is imperishable? That is never born, can never die. That is permanent. And that's your real nature. If you identify with that, you will find eternal happiness and eternal peace. But if you identify with the body like you're doing, it will grow old. And what will you do then? It will be time to die and you'll be disappointed. I don't see that this is an identification with the body. If anything, it's a, it's a removal from the body. You're working with the body, so you have to think about your dance steps. And you have to think about your dancing and you're having fun. That's all body work. Well, is it also that one shouldn't uh, mistake the release of endorphins in the brain to be a spiritual <laughs> spirit? <laughs> That's true, of course not. Endorphins in the brain has nothing to do with the self. The self is the self. It's self-contained, it's happy, it's peaceful, and it's knowledge. Everything else is transitory, it comes and goes. The free choice we have is with whom shall we identify? With the body or the self. And that's your choice. 
if you choose to buddy, then you come back life after life after life with other bodies. Because if you identify with the body, there's not only one body, there are many bodies. It never ends. You are creating your own body, lifetime after lifetime. Until the time comes when you become disgusted with the body. And then true spirituality begins. Another example. Say you love to go dancing. And you're coming home one day from the dance and you cross the street and the truck hits you. And they have to amputate your legs. What do you think of that by me? No legs and you can't dance. And now you have to stay in bed. And you're only thinking of when you used to dance. You've wasted your time. Yeah, but couldn't everything that you said about the body be applied to the mind also? Because the mind, as you have said yourself, is just a tool to move uh, beyond the mind. Mm, yes. So if, if that can be said of the mind, the same and if these these attitudes can be had toward the mind, they can also be had toward the body. Yes. They're both illusory. Of course. But you're using your body to realize that you're not the body. You're not using it to get further involved in relative things. You use the mind and your body to get rid of the mind and the body. You have to get more involved. That's why you watch yourself and you see yourself and you ask yourself, who loves to dance? Who loves to do all these things? I do. Who is this I? And we're talking about your personal I again. Everything is attached to the personal I. When you remove that idea that there's a personal I, true happiness automatically ensues. And then there's no question about it. Just like with me, I do not have to consider that dancing is more fun than being the self. There's no comparison. There's no comparison. I know what to say. Dancing is for a time only. Just like you're an artist and a writer. That's great. But it's for a time only. The time will come when you will not be able to do this anymore. You'll be too old. Then what? You look back and you'll say, Ah, oh, I used to be an artist. I used to be a great artist. I used to be a great writer. I used to be a great dancer. But look at me now, nothing. You'll commit suicide, perhaps. Because you cannot do anymore what you used to do or even totally involved in the body consciousness. That's why I say, find release now. Find freedom now. So you don't have to go through this again, again, again. Robert, how does all this stack up with your ideas about pursuing the life that is wonderful as it is and being involved in all activities with detachment? You have no choice. The activities that you're involved in, you are meant to be involved in them. And your mind will do what it has to do to make you further involved. The freedom you've got is simply the question, who am I? What is the source of I? And as you question, your involvement in life, so to speak, will become less and less. And you'll become happier and happier. But if you're not question, then you'll get deeper involved and deeper involved and deeper involved. 
And pretty soon you'll think that's your life. But again, as I said, you'll go over and over and over. And then you'll just drop dead one day. And you'll pick up another body and repeat the whole thing over again. There's no end to it until you give up that concept. source of your emotions and realize that in reality there are no emotions to begin with because there's only the self and the more you awaken to that fact that the self alone exists and everything else is false then you will begin to mellow out so it is gradual it depends no as you keep working on yourself you can awaken instantaneously and be free of it, or it can be gradual. It's up to you. It depends what you put into it. Everybody's different. In for some people, some people just wake up. When you have a dream, is there a preliminary before you wake up? Or do you just wake up? Everybody just wakes up. So it is with this. As you keep abiding in yourself, one day you will just awaken and be done with it and you'll be free. So don't think of preliminaries. Focus on the self. And everything will take care of itself. What I'm saying is, if, if, we, if we don't see progress within ourselves, if we continually see ourselves get upset with situations around us, we should not let that bother us. Keep observing, keep watching, and keep focusing on the self. And there'll be nobody to ask whose body it is meant by it. You only ask a question like that when your attention is more on the bothering than it is on the self. But if you change your attention and you put all your energy on the self, then you'll see what happens. But the question is, is that gradual? For some people, It depends how much time you give to it. Yeah, I'm saying that we can't just like turn our emotions off because 
because um, I can relate to you know, uh, the experiences I'm having at work. And sometimes when I go to, to the office, there's such an intensity there, and, and people are snapping at each other, and I get caught up, all caught up in it. And then I say to myself, uh, of course, I be, I'm aware, usually after the fact, and then I say to myself, well, is this something that mm, I'm aware of and gradually by, by um, abiding in myself, gradually I'll not identify with it, or is it something that, well, someday I'll suddenly awaken? <laughs> That's why I say in the morning when you first open your eyes, and that's the time to work on yourself and ask yourself, who am I? How do I get here? And reconcile yourself with yourself. If you do that the first thing upon waking up, then the whole day will be good. And you won't have those problems. Just don't get up and run out to work. Get up an hour early if you have to and see yourself for what you are and realize the truth. Focus on yourself. Ask yourself, who am I? And wait. Think of your source. Concentrate on the source of I am. Or just say to yourself, I am, I am and then go to work, and you'll see changes, miraculous changes. Well, what I'm saying is, uh, when I'm in the company of other people, not when, not, not when I'm alone, I'm saying when I'm in the company of other people, I tend to not be in control, it's such that I get caught up in whatever they're caught up in. Well, that's later. But if you're in the company of yourself, and you do the work on yourself, you will build up a power Right. That you will carry with yourself all day long, and that won't happen. It's, it's the whole thing of losing your center, losing <coughs> That's why before you go to sleep, and when you wake up, it's the time to work on yourself. If you do it correctly, it'll take over your life, and all will go over with you. Uh, I was still confused about this uh, abiding in the self. Abiding in the self, uh, you just mentioned a little while ago, uh, abiding in the self until you wake up. Um, abiding in the self, I, I thought it implies uh, knowing or being already the self and then abiding there mm -hmm. rather than uh, a gesture towards self, <coughs> like for instance, this certain inquiry would mean that may, uh, or may, or it may lead to that, to abiding in the self, but it's not an actual abiding in the self. Abiding in the self is knowing I am, is being I am. So when you say I am, you are abiding in the self. Now, to follow it to its source, say, for instance, um, if you find the, find the I by, by self-inquiry, abide in that, in other words, uh, being that, be, it, 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 I mean, to me, to be in that state is kind of like, you know, stateless, it's like, it's <laughs> like non-existent. And so to follow it, uh, what do you mean follow it? Because it's, it, it already seems like non-existence. See, don't worry about being non-existence. Simply observe the eye. Oh, I observe the eye and watch it going into the heart. So it, it's not so much a following, it's just that it happens of itself. It happens of itself, yeah. So Robert, when I contemplate I am, it means that right there I am abiding in Yes, it does. That's the same thing. Uh, now, this is empirical person or self which is saying I am. And however, does this, does this I am stay present, the empirical self? What was the last part? 
Uh, yes. And you're using your mind. Right, I'm using my mind and I'm still in duality. But in this contemplation of I am, the, the duality exists or it's present. When you're saying I am, I am, uh -huh. you are transcending the personal I and you are opening yourself up to your own reality. So a violence of in the self is taking place. Then. It's taking place right then and there. Robert, it, there's sort of, um, in most of this, it's because we have the concept we are not the self, we miss the fact that we are abiding in the self all the time. And, and, of course. And that's, and that's sort of what gets flushed out in this discussion in a way is that we only, like Raman says, we only have the doubt we are, the, are not the self, but the truth is we've always been that. Exactly. <clears throat> so we only have to lose something we don't even really have. <laughs> That's why we have to go through all this trouble to play all these games. <laughs> Until we realize I am the self, and that's it. And that's all you've ever been. The other has been a false line. But if we can't see that, then we have to play all these games, I guess. It's fun. Robert, if we don't know the self, and we're saying I am, What's to keep that from becoming a, a parrot-like repetition? It doesn't become a parrot-like repetition if you do it with your breath. If you inhale and say, I, you actually say, I am. I am. A subtle change of energy takes place within yourself. And you'll find you're becoming more peaceful and more calm. And pretty soon you will lose all identification with your body-mind. And you will remain as I am. It helps. Try it. So that, when you were saying earlier, you were also said, talking about uh, identifying with the self, identifying with the source. Mm. And in our state, or in my state of ignorance, when doing something as simple as just as saying I am and coordinating with the breath, is the best I could do to identify, to identify the way you're talking about? <coughs> well, that's one way to do it, do that. But then you should also ask yourself, who thinks they're ignorant? Who believes in other self? I do. Who am I? And you go right back to it again. You use the method that helps you the most. For some people, just saying I am does the trick. Other people have to work with the one I continuously. Self inquiry is the fastest way to wake up. Well, contemplating I am is uh, it's self inquiry itself. Yes, it is. Of course it is. Definitely. And uh, it's just a question of remembrance, what Richard was saying, actually. Yes. Uh, of course, uh, Ramana yourself uh, would say that we are the self, but we don't remember, so we need to work on it. And. Uh, one way is inquiry, of course, which takes several forms, which you have explained it thoroughly. And uh, particularly, I love too much this I am, because I can I can see a, I can see some some movement. I don't know how to explain it. A, a form of a movement of energy that's valid when I contemplate I am. Mm -hmm. So I thank you. I'm glad it's working for you. But be careful about these things. Don't be like the Santa Cruz lady who called me. She, she's a doctor. <laughs> and she was operating in the emergency room. And she stopped everything and called me and said, should I concentrate on I am while I'm operating? <laughs> <laughs> or should I just forget about I am for now? 
<laughs> oh, I wonder what happened to the patient. <laughs> you die. <laughs> Robert, when we do self inquiry, actually that's the beginning step to find the eye. When we develop a sense of of abiding in the eye, actually um, there's not too much need of self-inquiry because we go straight to the abiding. Self-inquiry has no beginning. If you do who am I, it's very powerful. It sounds simple, but it's very, very powerful. All you've got to say is, who am I? Take a pause. Say it again, who am I? And never answer. But keep saying, who am I? Who am I? Eventually something will happen. I'm saying if you develop a sense of self-abiding, then you can almost watch yourself go in and out of those states. You can almost watch yourself now identifying with the ego. And, and what I'm saying is um, self-inquiry is to get you to that state, but once you, 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 you you have a feel for that, you go directly to that. If you're abiding in the self, there's no ego to watch. Because there's only the self. You watch the ego with the mind, not with the self. So if you abide with the self, there's nothing else. You're finished. You're cooked. Everything else is of the mind. So when I say abide in the self, I mean forget everything and be yourself. There's nothing else to know at that point. Just be yourself. <coughs> I was only able to understand the use of the breath in connection with I am. You are unable to understand? Yes, I didn't grasp that. How you want to hell, you say I. You walk down, you say I am. With your breath. And you all next now. And you'll notice after a while, your breath begins to slow down. And the period between I am is becoming longer and longer. And pretty soon you lose body consciousness. And you get lost in I am itself. And you become consciousness. I am. Robert, uh, you say about the breath slowing down, sometimes in meditation, this is happening frequently now, that I, I seem to be unaware of the body and then the heart can stop or often I'm too aware of that, not breathing and then things just shot right back into the, into the body. That's all of the mind. It all comes out of the mind. Go beyond all that stuff. <clears throat> Do not pay attention to that. And quiet at home does that come. And go beyond it and abide in the self. See, we shouldn't get lost too much in procedures and methods. Remember, in reality, procedures and methods do not exist. Only the self exists. So use the methods and procedures with a grain of salt. Try to stay at the source. I and be free. I know that the more we talk about it, the more we talk about procedures. You can get lost in procedures. Be still and know that I am as God. So by keeping the mind still, you become God faster. So don't contemplate procedures. 
do the procedure if you have to, but go beyond it fast. Leave it behind and abide in the I am. I think it was either the Sargadat or somebody said that usually the sage gives a description of reality, not a prescription. He doesn't give, he doesn't give you something to do. You go to the doctor for that, you know. But he tells you where it's at or how it is, and, and it's for your uh, recognition, so to speak, instantaneously when you see it, you know. Because the reality is always the same, and when you see it is when you see it. It's interesting to note, what you're saying is true, but it's, it's interesting to note because all these words of Nisikadatta and Ramana were given to new students every time they came, and then they go away. And then new ones would come, and they would ask the same questions, and they would give the same answers. And that's how all the books were written. But what did they do with his direct disciples and the devotees? It was human to them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you know, I could only take your word in a way because I wasn't there and there's no no way of knowing it, but it makes total sense. Sure. This is why, as I said before, if I were a guest here for one time, I would fill you with the absolute, totally and completely, because you're not going to see me for another couple of years. But when I have to see you all the time, <laughs> you're, you're telling me about your practice and what's going on, and we have to have a dialogue, which is normal. Nothing wrong with that. We could still have a guest appearance. Have a guest appearance. <laughs> 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 then I. Then I I do that every time I see him. <laughs> what kind of truth are you looking for? <laughs> Just by being here, you've got it. Uh, Robert, from what I mean, reading about Ramana and. Uh, only people who would hang up in call with Ramana were actually uh, practicing or exerting not much of organic uh, inquiry as much of devotion. Exactly. Only devotion to the body, yes. to the presence of the, of the master. Yes, that's true. And um, probably they were getting more out of it than what he would be teaching. Uh, You're right. You're right. This is why I tell you every once in a while the story about the devotee who used to pull his fan. He used to stand by Ramana and pull his fan for 40 years. Then one day he dropped dead. And Ramana left him and told his devotees, he's all cooked. He's not, <laughs> he's not coming back again. And also, um, uh, it is from the profusion of descriptions they give about Ramana and what it would uh, effect on them. It seems, it seems that uh, they were all contemplating him tremendously. Yes, you're right. And, uh, is that a valid? I think that's as, as valid as uh, question, Jan. You're right. That's why it's a combination of bhakta and yana. That's valid, the contemplation of the master in his physical form. Yes. Being close to him. That's very true. And I think all that is part of the scene of, of Ajani of, and his, and his uh, disciples or devotees. You're right. God to himself. What's that? God to himself. Yeah, God to himself is right. This is why I said before, I don't know if you were here, but I said I would rather have five devotees with me than 5,000 lookers and seekers and searchers and disciples. Because the five devotees 
but to come realize in this life. The rest are only searching, looking. So you're right, absolutely. It's hard for a Westerner to understand that. Because a Westerner's ego is very, very big. No matter what you say. Shanti, 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 um, Shanti. <clears throat> Silence is the greatest teacher. Remember to love yourself, to bow to yourself, to pray to yourself, to worship yourself because God dwells in you as you. I love you, peace.